fund 5,000 megawatts in the next five years. I'm happy to announce in just over three years, we have already achieved 4,400 megawatts. So rest assured, sir, Yes Bank is going to exceed its commitments that it made in terms of funding uh, renewable energy. You would, you would know we were the first ever, ever Indian institution to do a green bond, wow. a masala green bond. We have been at the forefront. On your, sir, cost of funding, uh, let, me, let, me just, uh, let me just tell you, sir, for a bank, cost of funding is directly proportional to risk. Let me tell you today, we, when, you know, when we look at a NVVN Seki or a GUVNL project, we offer the best interest rates amongst all other states. Why? Sir, because of the payment discipline. If I can, what I can tell you, sir, financial, uh, private banks especially, they are commercial minded entities. If a state demonstrates good payment track record, and it does not treat renewable energy IPP developers as last in the line looking for payment, banks, banks will reduce the rate, the risk perception goes down. I, I don't think so any worthwhile project has in India so far has been denied, has not achieved light of the day because of financial closure issues or debt issues. You, you mentioned about foreign, foreign. The foreign banks do not have a long-term rupee book. So all the projects which are being financed in the country, renewable energy, wind, solar, are being done by Indian banks. And there has been flow of debt which has been easily available. What, re what is required, as you rightly mentioned, is the risk in the sector re needs to reduce, be it transmission, PPA grid back down, payment discipline, land acquisition. These are the risks which, you know, which, you know, which, you know, which forces us to kind of, you know, build that security cushion into the higher risk. Uh, there is an innovation that I would like to share regarding the payment security that he just mentioned. In Riva, we have a three-tier payment security uh, mechanism. The first tier is an LC, which is a standard thing. Uh, the second tier is a payment security fund. State guarantee is an innovation in the sense that the state government of Madhya Pradesh guarantees that if there is any delay in payment uh, on behalf of the discom to the developer, then the state government would pay. But now I would come to the second tier, that is the payment security fund. Uh, the payment security fund that SECI does is actually a budget-based fund. It's actually a fund in the bank, which they use to, you know, make good if there is any delay on behalf of the uh, DISCOM in paying to the uh, developer. Now, that has an inherent uh, drawback of uh, being limited in terms of its quantum, and it draws on budgetary allocation, so it's a drain on the uh, budget, though, even though it's an SOS requirement, but it's a drain on the budget. So we have developed what I think is a better way. Uh, uh, we have, a, I mean, under the PPA, there is a penalty for delay in payment. Now, typically, that penalty is more than the prevailing rate of interest in the market. So the system we have is that we have uh, developed some sort of an overdraft agreement with IRIDA. Uh, which is at basically the SBI uh, uh, rate. And the rate penalty under the PPA is the SBI rate plus 2%. So there is a margin there. So the margin of 2% there. So the system that we evolved is this, that in case the DISCOM is unable to pay, it informs our company, uh, uh, RUMS, that is the developer, or that is the solar park developer, uh, so it informs RUMS that we are facing a problem in the payment. RUMS draws on the overdraft and pay, pays the, the SBI rate to IRIDA. Now, the interest of the DISCOM is that while it would have had to pay SBI rate plus 2% if there was a delay, we have said that in case you seek our help, then you have to pay only SBI rate plus 1.75%. So they make a small saving there. We make an earning because uh, IRIDA is charging us SBI rate and we have to uh, pay only uh, SBI, so we, we make a uh, saving of 1.75% there. Uh, so it's, it's an all-win sort of situation with low limit on the, uh, no limit on the quantum of what you're doing. So the developer benefits, he gets his payment on time. The, uh, the DISCOM benefits, they have a reduction in the penalty amount. Uh, RUMS benefits by making some money. And well, IRIDA's job is to give uh, loans, so they benefit. So that's an innovation that we have developed to address the payment security challenge. 
Absolutely, sir. I didn't, yeah, perfect. Uh, because we're running short of time, let me now ask, uh, le, you know, let me now call upon Mr. Rahul Shetrapal, Vice President, Sterling and Wilson. Sir, you are one of the leading solar EPC as well as developers in the country. Maybe very quickly you can tell, you know, what are the one or two key challenges, uh, you know, uh, you know, that you face, what, uh, what are the possible remedies that the government and the policy makers can do about it, and what are the big opportunity spaces that you see going forward, you know, for this space in India and possibly even out, you know, the potential for Indian EPC companies like yours who have ventured abroad, and do you see that also as an emerging market for the Indian solar EPC players? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I uh, basically we belong to a company called Sterling and Wilson. Uh, we've done about uh, we will be commissioning about three gigawatts of solar by this uh, March in India as an EPC, and by next year about five gigawatt uh, across the world. Uh, that's the pipeline we have on, under construction. Having said that, we started in solar somewhere around 2010 and uh, 11 to be precise, uh, where we were basically coming from our electrical background and moving forward. Uh, and now, uh, I mean, the way I would put forward is that with respect to adoption and technologies, I don't think uh, we as a country have, you know, not reach the position what we have reached. Today, uh, there was a talk about 1500 volt systems. We are already deploying that in the country. There was a talk around uh, how to optimize uh, the costs and uh, you know work around most efficient positions around design, engineering, layouting. We are all doing that today as a nation. Uh, the challenges, I mean, the, so far, the growth prospect and the movement in the country has been all positive and we've all been able to succeed and bring down the tariffs across in the sector and support both sides of the country's dream and aspiration to move about from the uh, so-called dependency on imported uh, energy to a great extent uh, and the other perspective of getting the solar into a mainstream. Uh, but having said that, the way forward, as long as there's clear and transparent position and a long-term position positioned out for all developers in terms of policies, in terms of regulations, in terms of uh, you know, perspectives around execution, there will always be a challenge of scaling up from this position. Uh, to highlight a few of them, I think GST came in about almost you know, nine months uh, across, and still we don't have a proper clarity around that. Seven and a half percent import duty position being imposed still doesn't have a you know, clarity around that. How would anti-dumping or other provisions work out? And some of the you know, new bits talking about that it, they may not be a pass-through. How does the industry work around that? I think these policy related challenges on one side. The second side, I think, with respect to land. I mean, even parks have suffered with respect to acquiring land in time and giving it to developers. Land is one perpetual issue where somewhere or the other, we'll have to try and address how to look at land acquisition in a faster, uh, smoother way. I think that's the second challenge what every developer today faces and which comes through us as an EPC and when we offer our services across to our consumers. So the potential what was talked about in terms of 20,000 gigawatts of bids or perspective around that is a great potential. I think India will continue to do certain amount or great amount of that part of it when it comes to innovation, optimization, uh, lo lowest cost of electricity. I think all that as a country we are well built around. We can adapt any technology, we can move around with respect to various options around biofacials or monoperks or other uh, you know, positions which are being put forward. Spectrum utilization with respect to modules, that also is certainly an adaption which will happen as we go forward. The industry does not suffer from that side of the story. Industry definitely can pull that across. 
But what it suffers today is that if we really have to continue with the path what we have and go forward, we will definitely need policy clarity. We will definitely need land acquisition to be addressed in a proper and transparent manner. Uh, the uncertainties around the position, I mean, uh, uh, with all due respect, we talked about the position of security built-in for payment, but what happens when the regulator or the utility stops saying, I wouldn't buy the power? Where is the deep generation position perspective being built? Though thermal, like uh, was said, there's a two-part tariff. So at least one part of the tariff is still being paid, which is the fixed fall. And a company like, you know, Yes Bank can say, okay, at least I get some part of the position of revenue in that case. But how does solar get addressed with respect to non-buying of power? We need to somehow clarify some of these positions on policies. And I don't see that technology or any other barrier will be a challenge. Adoption of technology or delivery of technology will not be a challenge. Last year, we've delivered more than one and a half gigawatt on India as an executed projects on ground. So I don't see that if I am just one EPC in this country, there are many others, and we can deliver those with the velocity and the pace required. All what we need is clear grounds and sustained grounds for at least five, seven years that this dream can be achieved. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rahul, for your views. Uh, you know, so you are essentially a foreign-owned utility. You have large investments, especially on the wind side in the country. What, how do you look at the Indian scenario? You know, we have he heard some concerns by some foreign investors that maybe the returns in India are diminishing too fast in this sector to, you know, keep them attracted. How does SEMCOP view this? What are your plans for the country? And how do you evaluate India's renewable energy sector attractiveness compared to some of the other geography, uh, you know, the, some of the other Asian markets that you have access to? Thanks, Danish. Uh, as you have rightly mentioned, we have are, we are pioneered in the wind sector. We believe uh, the tariffs which these bits are, are sustainable, right? So, as a, as a developer, as a foreign investor, we are very much optimistic about the Indian power sector, especially the renewable sector. We have also uh, our assets in thermal. Coming to the returns part, yes, the, the basically the tariffs, the, ta the kind of tariffs which we are seeing these days, uh, that that calls for a lot of a lot of uh, you know things in in mind. So, the tariff is basically dependent upon your LCOE, right and there can be two ways to bring down the LCOE. One is if you go and cut your corners on the quality, make some compromises on quality, uh, then you can basically cut, cut down your capex and that's how you reduce your, uh, your tariffs. But for us, that is not a sustainable uh, kind of proposition. We believe there can be a better way to address that and that is through technical innovation. So uh, from the solar power's perspective, we, we believe that government should uh, come up with the uh, programs like uh, on, the, on the lines of uh, Chinese uh, front runner program, top runner program, which is going on uh, to incentivize uh, the developers who, who are basically quality conscious. So right now, uh, starting from modules till BOS, there are a lot of technical innovations which are going on uh, globally. They should penetrate into India and the government should support them. Like for modules, we have now, we're talking about uh, the increasing efficiency. We are now reaching up to 360 giga, 360 watt peak uh, capacity in the modules for monopark. And again, uh, we, we, in terms of uh, the BUS, uh, the inverters, we are 1500 volt systems uh, in place, which may go up to 2000 watt in, in the coming years. So, so all, all these combined, Will 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 provide uh, you know solar power as the cheapest source of electricity in this country, and it will be conducive for uh, the long-term players like us to have a sustainable project which is running up for 25 years of life and giving us the returns which which we are expecting in in this country. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Vinny. Um, uh, Alan, coming to you, I understand. So you you take care of engineering and procurement for clean tech. I think that you guys are more on the distributed side and the you know distributed side of things. Again, uh, how do you see the Indian uh, you know uh, Indian awareness about now quality uh, quality things? Uh, is it, it India continues to be a very price sensitive market, but then within that constraint, how do you push and how do you ensure that you take the best quality projects and how do you make the you know the financials work around that? 
uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Alan Kaur from Cleantech Solar. Just to give a little bit of a background, because I'm not sure everyone is familiar with clean, meaning to say we are in India, everyone calls us a RESCO model. So we, have, uh, we are operating in seven countries with over 70 sites and 70 megawatts of uh, project at the moment. So I'm, I'm also able to give a little bit of uh, the perspective between India and outside of India. I think overall the India solar industry has done a really good job in the sense you have created a lot of uh, talent in the market. There's a lot of good suppliers. Suppliers have been pushing one another. Developers have been pushing one another to drive costs down while maintaining a minimum level of quality. Of course, there are some plants that have failed in the past, but I think people have started to learn from that. So on that perspective, I would say definitely India is one of the most cost-sensitive market. In fact, even within cleantech, we recognize that the main drivers for uh, our customers to go green in India is almost always definitely cost. So having said that, we have observed in many other markets that cost is one major factor, but there are other factors, like uh, even competitiveness. Some companies, they want to, uh, they have certain obligations to their customers to go green. So that has been one driver, not as prominent in India, but uh, elsewhere. In, in terms of the market, I would say um, so far in India, we have done quite well. Uh, the market is really huge for us. Uh, people have very strong awareness. So it's different from overseas. Overseas, you go to the customer, people, are, they are asking you, what is solar? Here, everyone knows solar. They will just ask you the most, is it solar thermal or solar photovoltaic? So I think the awareness is there. People, most industries are ready to go solar. The only difference here is that often there might be some um, clarity in terms of policies, in terms of this comm side, in terms of net metering. I think net metering has been a big issue. It has been brought up uh, earlier by several of the panelists uh, that net metering is uh, consistently showing up as an issue, whether it be like multiple connection, single connection, is it LT, HT? So I think if there is uh, some more clarity on that area, that will certainly help the industry to push forward and help India achieve the, the amount of, uh, I think, 40 gigawatts required to hit the national targets. That is one important area that I see uh, with room for improvement. And same like every other developer uh, present today, we also face certain other issues like GST, the impact still not very clear as uh, rightfully brought up by Rahul earlier. And the anti-dumping, the uncertainty just slows down the market unnecessarily, in my opinion. And it leads everyone to take a wait and see approach. But everyone understands that the, the, the goal is clear, it's there. To take, you have to take all the steps now and start taking all the steps today in order to achieve the 100 gigawatt required by 2022. So just uh, maybe one more point in terms of the technical quality. Um, what we have found between India and outside of India, it's not so much a component quality issue. Often the components are of good enough quality. There might be some minor, minor differences. But as a company operating more than 50 sites in India, we have found that the real difference is always in the worksmanship and the attention to detail. That is something that uh, we have taken a lot of active steps, putting in processes, putting in quality assurance teams to address this. Some EPCs do it really well and others not so much. So that is, uh, as developers, owners of projects that are meant to last 25 years, we've taken very active steps to make sure that these plants actually will last 25 years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, we'll just now... Uh Manuji, you know, one of the most common challenges across any forum of renewable energy would be land acquisition. I'm sure, you know, we have heard it again and again. You know, just, you know, just from, a, you know, from your hat as an IS officer, uh, you know, we heard about the huge initiative government was taking and state government were taking toward digitization of land records. Theoretically, now we have a blockchain technology where it's possible to now actually start maintaining, you know, tamper-free records of any kind of land transfer can happen. You know, technology is there today to help us overcome. Well, can you just tell us again in the state of Madhya Pradesh, if you can update, how have those projects of, around digitization of land records, how have they been going? Are there any other thoughts to consider, you know, what the, you know, what the governments can do to, you know, ease this? Because I'm sure this is not just a challenge for this industry, it is for a challenge for 
the overall urbanization and industrialization of the country any you know any thought from you on you know on this on this aspect actually i'm slightly confused because uh, i had not shared with him that i have two charges these days apart from renewable energy i also look after science technology and it so okay. this is what we have been doing but anyway uh, jokes apart uh, the digitization of land records has proceeded very well in most states including uh, madhya pradesh so what i'm saying is now being done in almost all states but now we have a system for example that uh, the registry office where you you know have um, i mean uh, the land uh, ownership change hands so as soon as you register it is linked to the database so uh, you need a mutation application to change ownership from a to b so as soon as you have a registry the application for uh, mutation is somoto filed and the notices for uh, that are issued to the various parties for mutation are automatically issued by the system so if a sells to b and he gets sets a registry automatically it's it gets registered in the court of the concerned revenue officer because in the when the registry the uh, 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 location of land is there so from the location it maps to the jurisdiction of the revenue official uh, it automatically registers in the in the what is called the daira panji or the court register of the revenue official it is registered as a case a case number is generated uh, then notices are somoto issued to the both a and b and uh, it's also displayed on the collectorate notice board and the website so these things are already happening uh, however having said that i would say that when we are talking of mega projects like uh, the what india talks talking about 500 700 50 1000 megawatt projects then we need essentially huge chunks of government land so uh, one has to accept that there are certain states with that sort of land being available and other states where land is a challenge i mean you can't expect to find this sort of land in uh, delhi but obviously madhya pradesh or rajasthan Uh, would have such uh, uh, availability such large chunks of land uh, for example in the riva project that we had it is a 750 megawatt project requiring 1500 hectares of land now uh, 1500 hectares i mean uh, for people who i mean it's almost like a 15 square kilometer of area it's like 3 kilometer into 5 kilometer sort of an area so uh, fortunately there was a, a huge chunk of land that was available so out of the 1500 hectare around 1250 hectares was government land and the remaining 250 was private land uh, in madhya pradesh we have a policy which is very helpful in uh, getting private land uh, that is a, a policy which says that uh, if government needs land then and if the seller is willing to sell it himself then the government would buy it at twice the guideline rate at twice the what is loosely called the collector rate so uh, this is usually helpful because in such areas for example the riva project it was essentially a plateau uh, which is a non arable area so even uh, the people who had that 250 hectares of land uh, they were not using it for tilling they were not using it for agriculture it was allotted to them through some uh, government policy but they were not tilling land so if they getting twice the guideline rate then it was a very attractive way uh, to get land and it was uh, uh, without any uh, hassle on our part because there was no discretion in how much amount we could give it was laid down in the government policy it's at twice the rate so we could uh, uh, you know buy the land at a fixed rate however yes a learning is that helps if you procure the land before the project fin starts so in our case in riva for uh, case riva's case uh, what we had done was that as the bidding went ahead we had a link on our website where we showed the entire land and we showed the land that was with us in a certain color so as the project moved ahead and approached the date of bidding people could actually see that we were acquiring more and more land and on the day of bidding we had 98% of land was already available with us so they were confident that land is available and another good thing that we have in the riva project which is uh, an example of de-risking a project uh, was that in usually a problem say in a road project in india is that you are given 3 years to complete the road and you get the land 2 and a half years later so you are left with 6 months to build the road where as you should have given uh, got 3 3 years and then you have to go to the some authority for the request for extension of date which is granted as a discretion and uh, uh, very often i mean there are 
uh, I mean, either a consideration or allegations of consideration and so on. So to avoid all that, in our contracts, we had mentioned very clearly that the day zero of the, of the contract, when the obligations of the developer start, is when he gets 90% of the land. So day zero of the uh, project was not the signing of the PPA. The, it very clearly said that when the conditions subsequent are fulfilled, one of the conditions subsequent was uh, providing of 90% of the land. That, would, that is when the obligations of the developer would kick in. And as the developer was sure through the, uh, I told you the website which had the map, that 98% of the land is available, he was confident that, okay, I mean, uh, we can start as soon as the PPA is signed because the land is already available with them. Thank you so much, sir. I think so. We need a compendium of the best practices and learning from Reva, which needs to be distributed across states, across government departments. I think so. You know, I think that will go a long way. Uh, so, uh, I think we are horribly out of time. Just time for three questions. Uh, please identify yourself, identify the person to which the question is directed, and again, keep it, keep, keep your question short and direct it as a question. Can we have the mic, sir? Ask Mr. Manu. What is the reason to go behind the <clears throat> price uh, uh, escalation in uh, tariff you have given in Re uh, Riva project? Because all the bidding bids are fixed uh, price bidding. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, see, I must tell you that when Riva project came up, ours was a new company. Uh, we had set up RUMS, set up in July 2015, uh, and we were competing with uh, NTPC and Seki and. Uh, uh, such big companies and we did not have VGF support with us. Whereas a Seki project had VGF support, government refused to give us VGF support. At that time, the prevailing uh, uh, target tariff was 5 rupees. And uh, if Seki got a tariff of our NTPC or tariff of 5 rupees, they could, uh, you know, use VGF to come to 5 rupees. Later, it was brought down to 450. Uh, I mean, I took it as a personal challenge that we would have a better tendering than what they do. And uh, government of India said they would refuse to give the VGF. I took it as a challenge that, okay, we would go ahead and do it. So the challenge before us was that if we got a tariff of, let's say, 451, and then, uh, you know, uh, Seki would have a tariff of 450. So it was difficult for any procurer to procure power from us. So it was more with a, you know, I mean, anyway, we got a tariff is far lower. We got tariff of 297 as first year tariff. But essentially, the reason was acceptance of the tariff by the procurer. Because, I mean, see, every procurer, see, I mean, you, your question is the, from the point of view of the developer and from the point of view of a banker that they would want a flat tariff and rather you would want a decreasing tariff because all your cost is really front end. So you would prefer if 80% of the cost is paid in the first year and only O&M is paid later. However, the procurer would prefer a slightly increasing tariff because that is how the retail tariff increases. The retail tar tariff increases in a, uh, around 5% every year. So it makes more sense to the procurer to have a, a slightly increasing tariff. Uh, though I agree, but I, I believe that a developer and uh, the banker would trust the Excel sheet far more than a procurer. Because the procurer has a more, greater problem of living from day to day. You know, discoms are on the edge, all discoms are on the edge. So for them, it is important that, uh, I mean, uh, say a 297 tariff of Riva translates to a 330 levelized tariff. So for them to be buying uh, power at 297 the first year, even if it increases to a higher level later, is a more palatable proposition uh, than buying at 330. So it was looking at the point of view from the procurer. But, you know, um, Manoji, you mentioned that typically a banker would want a flat, but, you know, there is, you, you know, we, you heard most of the panelists uh, raise questions around the quality which is being used. In one sense, uh, increasing tariff also gives an incentive to the developer not to do a short change in terms of the quality of equipment, because he knows that at the 15th year, his tariff is possibly higher, and therefore the quality that the, the, the quality of product he's putting in has to ensure that it generates optimally at the 15 year. In that sense, the interest is actually aligned with the project finance lender who is giving him a 15 to 18 years loan. So I think that's something which, you know, you know, where the interest actually get aligned, you know, you know, in an escalating kind of a tariff. Um, okay. Uh, uh, furthermore, I may just add that there is also change of law provision. So which could also result in an increase in tariff. Great. Uh, one last question, please. Uh, regarding the power sector in this country, somebody said 
It's not the problem that problems are not known. It's not the problem that problems are not known. It's not the problem that solutions are not known. Problem is nobody wants to put the right solution in front of the right problem. Anyway, sir, having said that, because whatever we are doing in the renewable, uh, the large scale development, <coughs> most of it has already been done in the uh, conventional sector. We came up with the UMPP, low tariffs. Still, Tata and uh, Adani are in a different situation today. The last two days, Sensex has crashed because of those NPAs. So I don't know how these large scale projects will pan out in next five to 10 years. This Uday scheme and all, everything has come up. Every 10 years, it comes up with a new reincarnation for the DISCOM. But the fundamental problem is whatever last mile connectivity, the last consumer who has to pay, who bears the highest losses, for whom the highest capital investment has to be made by way of transmission line, distribution network, transformer and all. The question which was coming since morning was how the DISCOMs can be incentivized to put up more solar. Now, if I say, may, okay, yeah. the last point which says that can we put the, those last mile people, those households, can we incentivize them to put up the solar so that the loss level reduces, the capital investment of the DISCOM reduces, rather than only looking at the large scale power projects in the solar sector. So DISCOM may get incentivized in that way. Uh, see, I, I would fully agree with, uh, you know, what, uh, your solution and partly it is being accepted, I would not say fully. Uh, for example, uh, Chhattisgarh has, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the example you give is also true for electrification of pumps. Now, see, I mean, when we say that all the villages in India are electrified, this is, you know, partly correct, like most things in the life. So, because the definition of uh, electrification in India is that in a village, 10% of the population should be connected to electricity. Uh, one SCST hamlet in the village should be connected and one government building should be connected. So, it is possible to have a village with 90% of the houses with no electricity, with all but one government buildings with no electricity and all but one uh, SCST hamlet with no electricity. It's still, it's called electrified. So, a large number of houses might not have electricity. Further, I mean, a village is, you know, you could have a village like this with people living just here. So, it's possible to have electricity in the habitation, but not in the farms. So, uh, you know, there is no electricity very often in the farms. So, uh, Chhattisgarh has made a policy decision that they would not extend the electrical network beyond the present level. Because as you rightly said, the more you extend the network, the more are the losses. A, there is capital investment involved, capital investment with hardly or no return. It's difficult to maintain and it increases the losses. So Chhattisgarh have made a decision that they would not extend the electrical network at all. Whatever new pump needs to be electrified, they would place a solar pump there. So it is actually a, a, you know implementation of what you said. The same would be true for those hamlets where power has not reached. It might be better to have solar energy solution there. Of course, it would really help if we have a battery solution there. Because, I mean, otherwise there is hesitation in the people living because there is actual demand that comes from the villages not to have a solar energy based thing because the problem is that our batteries don't last uh, that long because most of the uh, projects where, uh, which are operational like this have lead acid batteries which face problems in some year. So if the lithium ion batteries are increasingly used and the quality is good and so on and you build our projects better, then perhaps what you're saying could become true and it actually helps the so I agree with you. Comprehensive and interesting and overly enthusiastic, uh, I would say, uh, session. Uh, and I would like to take the opportunity to present some uh, uh, mementos of appreciation to all the panel. For that, Mr. Danish Verma to present the uh, mementos to the uh, to all the panelists, beginning with Mr. Manush Srivastava from MPU Vikas Nagam Limited. Followed by Mr. Narsimhan. <laughs> to Mr. Rahul Shetpal from Sterling and Wilson. <laughs> Mr. Vineet Taneja from Samcorp.
and Mr. Alan Kaur from Clean Tech Solar. And I would like to present the memento to Mr. Danish Sharma myself. Can we have a loud round of applause for the entire panel?